on Friday, we looked at the cross and uh, Harold helped us understand this, the unsanitized cross. So often uh, with Christmas and Easter and because of how in our culture we've like built up this massive uh, thing around both Christmas and Easter, they kind of get really sanitized. So Christmas is kind of really cute and, you know, it's about fluffy angels and cattle are lowing and it's all really cute and, uns- and sanitized. And often we do the, sa- the same to Easter, although what I, what I really enjoyed is the wrong word, but found uh, impacting about Friday is to kind of remove a couple of the layers of the gloss and get down to what materially happened. Is that Jesus died for us and a gruesome, uh, even grotesque, um, shameful death in his day and in, in, in the time, no honor, no glory, not, not at least with human eyes, to look upon Jesus, just shame and degrading death. And as we look at the resurrection, what we want to do as well is peel back a couple of those layers of, you know, just the veneer of, oh, isn't that lovely? The tomb was empty, and now we get to have chocolate Easter eggs. And those two things are wonderful. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not equaling, like, you know, I'm not equivocating here, but <clears throat> what I want to do is understand what actually, what, what is the resurrection? One of the, in one of his writings uh, to the church in Corinth, Paul writes, man, the resurrection, it basically all hinges on the resurrection. Where if the resurrection is not real, if Jesus didn't physically bodily rise from the dead, then we are of all people the most to be pitied. So we are fools, we're idiots, we're stupid if the resurrection isn't real. But he says, as it is, the resurrection is real. It's wonderful, it's amazing. It's, you can't talk about the resurrection without talking about death, can't talk about Jesus' resurrection without talking about Jesus dying because you need to die in order to be raised to life. And we can't talk about us sharing in his resurrection unless we also talk about us dying. And here's the thing, whether we like to think about it or not, and we hate to think about it as a culture, we're all going to die. I don't don't say that flippantly. Uh, We take all of our sick people and we put them in a place for sick people. Part of that's because we can put, you know, specialist care there. We take our older people, we... Stick them all together out of the way. We took, take our dying people, put them out of the way so we don't have to confront death. Because we all know we're all going to die. <clears throat> and yet it's incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, just this, man, the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, th- you will have gone through seasons like this. I'm going through one of these seasons now where it just seems like people around me are, people are, there's death all over the place. My auntie died last week. Uh, one of our ministry interns a few years back just a young woman in her 20s, her husband just died this week, this past week. Uh, I know people in this room who's, who've had friends die this week. Family members die recently. Death. Man, if we, if we don't sanitize it, if we actually sit in the reality of a... Oh, thank you, whoever did that. If we sit in the reality of a fallen world where we're going to die and we understand death, <clears throat> then... Uh, we can pull back some of those layers, uh, sanitizing death, which will then help us when we pull back those layers to unsanitize the resurrection as well. So as we're looking at the re- resurrection today, uh, one of the things that I find um, phenomenal about the resurrection, and the scripture writers mention this a bunch of times, is that we don't grieve, we who are in Christ, over people who have died among us, or friends and family who are also in Christ, uh, we, don't de- we don't grieve as those who have no hope grieve. Uh, almost exactly a year ago, in fact, on Easter Sunday, one year ago, so last year, Easter Sunday, it was about a week later, so April 17, so we're almost at the one-year anniversary, <clears throat> my dad, who used to be a, a pastor, used to be a minister, and uh, still preaches, uh, he went to preach at an old folks home about the resurrection because it was Resurrection Sunday, really wonderful. Great thing to be able to talk about and celebrate to uh, celebrate about. On his way back from preaching about the resurrection, uh, he was hit by the proverbial bus, but in his case, it was also a literal bus. Uh, was like 
choppered to Flinders in a coma, in a coma for a while, <clears throat> came to and we're still out of it for a long time. And I remember, uh, especially on the first day and then in a couple of days after that, when it was, when it kind of were, as a family, kind of processing it and going, okay, uh, here's my dad. He's not a young man. He's had a really wonderful life, loves Jesus, who's just like literally perhaps the last words that have come out of his mouth was talking about the resurrection. And we were talking with uh, family members saying, what do we pray for here? Uh, as those who live in the hope of the resurrection, do we pray that he has, that he you know, comes out of this coma and comes to and <clears throat> lives a much shortened, a much more difficult life because it, it looked like he had extensive brain damage and probably looked like multiple broken bones and fractures and swelling and uh, what do we pray for here? Or, as those who hope in the resurrection, do we pray, oh, Lord, bring him to yourself. When my dad came to, he didn't make much sense for, for quite a while, uh, but in those rare moments of lucidity, he would say the same thing to me. He said, oh, Donnie, that's why he called me. Nobody else calls me that, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Except back when I'm in trouble sometimes. Um, he said, Donnie, what should I be hoping for here? I said, I, I want to go be with Jesus. But also, I want to be here with my wife and kids and grandkids and I still have voice and I still want to... I said, what do I, what do I hope, what do I pray for? What do I ask God for? And as it was even talking with the doctors, they never mentioned anything remotely looking like a normal life or full recovery. Uh, in fact, the neurosurgeon who was operating on my dad a couple of times was a, was a mate of mine. And, he, and his mum had actually gone through a very similar thing very recently. She was knocked off a bike as well. And he said, man, you just can't, you can't hope. As it is, he's made an unbelievable recovery, like an unbelievable recovery. <clears throat> but our hope was never in his recovery. Our hope was always in the resurrection. And so as we who belong to Jesus, we who look to, again, that most central event in all of history, the cross and the resurrection, I'm putting them together, they're separate events, but obviously related. You can't have the latter without the former. Uh, we, we love and we cling to the cross because like we saw on Friday, because Jesus vicariously died our death, because he has in his body borne all of our sin, all of our rebellion, because he's taken upon himself and covered with his precious blood that was spilled all of our sin and made us right, Righteous, perfect, holy, blameless, spotless in him. We cling to the cross. Uh, but our greatest hope is in the resurrection. Because one thing to be made right with God and then live a good life and then die. It's another thing to be made right with God and then share in Christ's inheritance forever. This is what Peter says. First Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So what is the nature of the resurrection? What's the nature of his mercy? It says here, it's been, it is according to his great mercy. So not, not according to your goodness, not according to your righteousness, not according to your great faith that you can muster up, not according to your accomplishments, not according to your circumstances, not according to how good or how difficult your life has been, not according to your social media follow account, not according to how you feel about yourself today, not according to how you're going to feel about yourself tomorrow, not according to how you're going to feel about yourself any day, 
not according to your circumstances at all, not according to how others treat you, not according uh, how you, uh, to how you even view yourself. His mercy is according to his great mercy. This gift is according to his great mercy. He has done the work. The Father sent the Son. The Son voluntarily came. The Spirit initiated the call. He gifted you with the faith needed to receive the, the grace and his love. He's shown mercy to we who don't deserve it. He's given us a new heart. He's made us a new creation. He has conquered death so that although we die, we live. This is wonderful, not because we're awesome, not according to our best effort on our best day applied over our whole life, but according to his great mercy. It's wonderful news. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. And what are we born again to? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In Paul's letters uh, to the Colossians, he says, once you were alienated from God, you were separate from him. And you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. Ephesians 2, we saw this a couple of weeks ago. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And a little further, it says, we were by nature objects of wrath, of God's righteous wrath, holy wrath. And then a later, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. So again, According to his mercy, Peter says, Paul says, according to his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions because it's by grace you've been saved. John also says this, the Apostle John, uh, first John says, in this the love of God was made manifest among us. The God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. <clears throat> so absolutely, Jesus died for your sins. We can definitely say that. Scripture says that. That's absolutely true. It's what he saved you from. What did he save you to? He saved you to righteousness. He saved you to relationship with him. He saved you to perfection. And even in uh, our life today, he saved you to do good works that he's prepared in advance for you to walk in. He saved you to an inheritance. And he saved you for himself, to life. If we walk through this passage in Peter backwards, like to get a, to really see the logical flow, this is, what it, this is what it looks like. It says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we have a living hope, which we receive by new birth, which God has given us according to his great mercy. So let me go it again. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this is the... This is the means. This is the, this is the thing. This is the focus. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the, dead, from the dead, we have a living hope. Not a dead hope. Not a hope that will die, but an alive and even an everlasting hope. Not a hope as in, well, oh, I hope it doesn't rain later so the Easter egg hunt's not ruined. It's not that kind of hope. Or a hope to win the lottery one day, which is just a fanciful dream. This is a sure hope. He's saying, where is our confidence? It's in the resurrection of Jesus. We have a living hope, which we received by new birth, which God gave to us according to his great mercy. So it's because of the resurrection we have hope and new life. What is the quality of the hope? He goes on to say, it says, to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven. So it's imperishable, doesn't run out. Inexhaustible inheritance. It's a hope that doesn't fade over time. It's a hope that you can't get to the bottom of the bag, can't plumb the depths of. There's no depth. The hope that goes on forever. It is imperishable, doesn't finish. It is undefiled. It's perfect. There is no hint of imperfection, no defects, no flaws, no what ifs, no wondering when am I going to get found out. It is undefiled, this hope. It is sure. It is perfect. 
and it's unfading. It doesn't get less awesome over time. It does it seem amazing today and then less amazing tomorrow and then less amazing the next day and less amazing the day after that. We can, we can perceive it to be less amazing. We can forget about it. We can become too familiar with it, just like we can become too familiar with the cross and what Jesus has done on it. Where the, closer, the further away we get from it, the more we forget about it. We can do this with the cross. We can do this with the resurrection, where the resurrection hasn't lost any of its glory. The cross hasn't lost any of uh, the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. But we can forget about it. Or again, when we become too familiar or <clears throat> too far from it. But it doesn't fade. It doesn't get less awesome. And the more we sit at the foot of the cross and the more we live in light of the resurrection, the more we behold the glory of these things. The more we understand the glories of these things. And lastly, Peter says, it is kept in heaven for you. God himself is keeping it at his house. The most secure place it could possibly be is with God. So your inheritance can't be stolen, can't be lost, can't be forgotten or left somewhere. It is kept, not even by you, it's kept by God. He's the one keeping your inheritance. He's the one holding on to your future with his righteous right hand. This, this is why we glory in the resurrection. And then he finishes the thought, he says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So it's by, it's by God's power, not by your awesomeness, not by your faith or your ability to cling to God, but by God's clinging to you. You're being guarded through faith to be revealed in the last time. Meaning even when the resurrection uh, people are dying all around you. And it sucks. And it hurts. And you're wondering, where, where is God in this? That we can remind ourselves that God is actually imminent, intimately involved in our lives. And that He is the one who is holding on to you and to your future to be revealed in the last time. And so we don't lose hope when things look grim. The world that Peter and Paul and John are writing in, where they're saying we've got this great hope in the resurrection, they have their friends and their family members not just dying of, of natural causes and not trying to diminish the grief of those things. They're having dozens and dozens of their friends and family brutally murdered for their faith. And they're saying, we cling, to the we, we cling to the resurrection. We don't despair. We're not crushed. We don't lose hope. Because our hope is not in this world. So at the start of the, this brief passage from Peter, we saw we have new life in Jesus' resurrection according to his great mercy, kept by his great power, meaning when you feel frail and weak, your strength may waver. Even your confidence may waver. We can be confident that his strength never wavers. My strength wavers. My confidence wavers. Our, our faith can waver. His faithfulness never wavers. And it's his strength, in his strength, that we're secure. Jesus' resurrection means you are saved to a greater hope in a greater strength than your own. We know our bodies will fail, but we eagerly wait for our new bodies. This is the conversation I was having again with my dad, lying in a hospital bed, not knowing if he'll ever walk again, not knowing if he'll ever do anything, not even knowing if he's really going to survive. And he says, man, my hope is in the resurrection. It's not to try to diminish the grief and the suffering and the loss we have in this life, but to say that the glories that are coming are so, so far surpassed the griefs that we have, the griefs that we have in this life. Paul says they're not worth comparing. And so to that I say, don't, don't let that 
don't take that as, well, then I, I shouldn't grieve. Take that as grieve deeply. Grieve well. Knowing that uh, the, even the deepest of grief is incomparable to the glories that are to come. And so it doesn't diminish the glories that are to come. It just shows how glorious they are, knowing we can grieve really well now. Secondly, guarded through faith. This faith is both the power of God and the power from God. He's the source of our faith. He's the object of our faith. He's the strength of our faith. It's wonderful. This is actually a very freeing thing for us. To know it's not about how much you cling to God. It's about how much he's clinging to you. In fact, that helps us to cling to him. To know he doesn't let us go. I heard one say, you don't need great faith in God. You need faith in God. You don't need great faith in God. You need faith in a great God because it's the object of your faith that matters. And lastly, again, revealed in the last time, we haven't fully received it yet. Although we are, in a sense, already living in resurrection power now, in that death has lost its sting, uh, we are yet to fully receive and live in the resurrection when we receive our resurrected bodies. We have it in part, but on the whole, meaning you'll still fall, you'll still be weak, you'll still waver, still stumble, you'll still have pain, you'll still have doubts, uh, you'll still need to repent, but we have confidence that a day is coming when we'll join Jesus in his resurrection more fully, join him in his inheritance more fully, and it means when you do falter because of the cross, because of the resurrection, we never have to run from God. We can always run to him because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what we need to do is not, not go, well, yes, uh, cross, tick, uh, resurrection, tick, and now let's just get along with our lives. But rather we, we sit at the foot of the cross. We're the ones who can fully be free from trying to project a sanitized version of ourselves to the world, but rather we can show all of our flaws and failures because our hope is not in our own righteousness, but in Christ's imputed righteousness. They're totally free from our sin, totally free from the penalty of sin, totally free from the power of sin. And in the resurrection, we look forward to the day when we're totally free from even the presence of sin. We have the most wonderful of hope to so consider the cross and live in light of the resurrection. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for the great hope we have in Jesus. You've loved us, I mean, unimaginably when we consider who we are and our rebellion against you and even just in the in the kind of realm of creation, how seemingly insignificant and inconsequential we are. And yet you, the sovereign creator God over all things, have made us, loved us, called us, saved us, restored us, redeemed us, removed our shame, removed every stain, taken away our guilt and given us your love at great cost. So Father, we today we're considering the death of Jesus, we're considering the resurrection of Jesus and our participation in his death and our, and our participation in that resurrection. Uh, and we, we just say thank you. We, we just say glory to you. God who has loved us and has acted upon us with uh, I mean, unimaginable mercy according to the riches of your mercy, not according to our goodness. Father, we love you. We thank you. Help us, please, Lord, by your spirit in us. Help us to live in light of the resurrection every day. We wouldn't uh, grieve as those who have no hope, but live not fearing death, uh, live not fearing anything, because we have this most great hope that we will live forever with the gift of immortality restored and right 
relationship with you forever. It is the most wonderful hope and it is the reality of our lives and we're so thankful. We pray this in Jesus' name.